Hi, I'm Bill Patrick. The program you're about to see is part of a vintage series called Car and Track, which was originally produced during the first half of the 1970s. Before we begin the show, though, a brief program note. Using as many as eight cameras to shoot a single event, Car and Track captured some of the great NASCAR competitions of the era, one race at a time. Over the course of some 80 episodes through six seasons, series producer and host Bud Lindemann lovingly documented a unique era in American motor racing. While the race action contained in the series remains timeless, the program itself has not dated quite so gracefully. Although the years have not been overly kind to Bud's decidedly low-key introductions and interviews, we believe them to be an integral part of this one-of-a-kind series. So please, stay with us now as Speed Vision presents a rare slice of 1970s Americana, car and track. Two races and two road tests fill this show from top to bottom. The first event is a wild USAC sprint race on the half-mile dirt track at Eldora, Ohio. And then a road test of Volkswagen's pride and joy, the new 412 sedan. It's no Beetle, believe me. And also the good old southern boys from NASCAR take to the Daytona International Speedway for another shorty. The second 125-mile qualifying race, staged just three days before the classic 500-miler. And we'll wrap it all up with a test of Oldsmobile's brand new Cutlass. Now this one has the 442 package on it and falls in a class by itself. We'll meet you at Eldora in 60 seconds. Every year, the USAC Sprints make a couple of stops at Eldoro Speedway, located in the middle of the sprawling farmlands of Ohio. Eldoro is a fast, half-mile banked dirt track, which keeps the fans on the edge of their seats with wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. All of USAC's finest were here. Last year's Sprint champion, Sammy Sessions. Gary Bettenhaus, Raleigh Beal, and Johnny Parsons. Heavy rains right up till race time left the track spongy, and it didn't take the cars long to chew it up, leaving deep ruts in every groove they could run. All drivers climb aboard and are pushed out for the start of this 40-lap main event. Tom Bigelow starts on the pole with Johnny Parsons alongside. Raleigh Beal and Sammy Sessions make up the second row, with Bruce Walkup and Gary Bettenhausen filling out the third spots. All cars down out of four, and there's the green. Johnny Parsons takes the lead as the traffic is tight. Car number 29, Billy Casella, got high in the marbles in turn two, rode up on the guardrail, and rolled three times. The caution flag is out, so let's take another look at that accident from a different angle. Billy was okay thanks to a well-constructed roll cage. With the car cleared off the track, it's a complete two abreast restart as all cars take the green. Once again, Parsons jumps into the lead with Sessions taking the number two slot. In the third turn, Sammy takes the high road and grabs the lead from Parsons. is pushing now on every turn of the racetrack trying to keep that number one car in sight. Gary Bettenhausen moves into the third slot right behind Parsons. That's all she wrote for car number 16, Jesse Niemeyer, as his car overheated. 
Now, Sammy Sessions has his own problems as the jarring and bouncing over this rough track has worked his oil filter loose, and he's dropping oil all the way around. Sammy gets the black flag and is forced out of the race. Parsons once again inherits the lead, but can the cars hold out under this abuse? George Snyder moves up on the tail of Parsons and in turn one takes the lead away. There's the white flag, only one more lap to go as Parsons is trying everything in the books to regain the lead. In turn three, they get tied up in traffic. Parsons low, Snyder high as they head for a flat out drag to the finish. George Snyder grabs the win by a scant three feet as the rest of the field limps into the pits. George Snyder took the number one slot with Johnny Parsons second, Raleigh Beal third, Joe Saldana taking the number four spot with Larry Dixon rounding out the top five finishers. Snyder led only two laps of this 40-lap grind, the last two, the two that counted over what the Eldoro officials claimed to be the worst track conditions ever in its history. But with victory in his pocket, it doesn't look like George Snyder really cared. W412 model is the former 411 with a facelift. The front fenders and hood are completely restyled. Rear tail lights have grown and the dashboard features a wood grained inlay. But more important, the 412 gives the bug owner something to move up to. They move it forward, backward, and around turns with the help of this four cylinder 102 cubic inch engine, delivering 76 horsepower and about 20 miles to the gallon. 2,500 pounds came out of the hole in pretty good shape. 30 miles an hour took 4.4 seconds. We had the tires hot, so the bite was better on this run. Zero to 45 in 6.7 seconds. 2,700 RPM gave us 95 foot-pounds of torque and at an 8.2 to 1 compression ratio. It took 11.3 seconds to coax it to 60 miles per hour. Our four-door Berlin Beauty did well through the pylon course. Body lean was hardly noticeable, even with the cones closed up. Steering seems quick and very responsive. They employ a worm and roller with a steering damper. The front end stuck well, however the back seemed light. With a 98.4-inch wheelbase, the 412 gave us a 37-foot diameter turning circle. It actually performed better through the pylon course than it did in cornering on the track. Recovery was good. We made a whole batch of good straight line stops with this little car. This one from 30 took 39 feet. With discs up front and drums in the rear, heat was dissipated rapidly. Pedal fade was negligible. From 50, we stopped in 93 feet.
In this 70 mile an hour panic stop, you'll notice very little nosedive. She ground to a halt in 197 feet. The total brake swept area on this model is 85.2 square inches. In high speed cornering, body lean seemed excessive, especially on the interior. They used coil springs, independent struts with lateral control arms, a stabilizer bar, plus telescopic shocks up front. In the rear, more coil springs, trailing arms, diagonal links, and telescopic shocks. This reverse camber turn is a tough one, but it really tests the suspension system. As you can see, the right front wheel is off the ground. The front end bounces severely, leaving the driver with very little control. We lack the muscle to power it through the turns, and the nose developed a tendency to wash out. In performance, we rated the 412 as an average compact. But it's a good-looking car with a well-done interior. This, coupled with VW quality, should make it a good seller. Then, too, at least now, a Beetle owner has something to graduate to. Here is a prelude to the Daytona 500. America's fastest stock cars and finest drivers line up for two 125-mile qualifying races, of which this is the second. These races determine their starting positions for the 500-mile classic. With only 125 miles between the green and the checkered flags, it's a flat-out run for the money all the way. Pete Hamilton starts on the pole with Jim Van Diver alongside. Number 14, Cuckoo Marlin and Herschel McGriff are right behind them. A.J. Foyt and Joe Frizan are in the third row. Onto the front chute, there's the green, and they're off. Hamilton fires that big Plymouth number nine into the lead with Cuckoo Marlin's 14 Chevrolet taking over second. Down the long back chute, Marlin slides under Hamilton as they enter turn three. They're door to door. Now Foyt and Van Diver move up, and suddenly it's a four pack looking for daylight. No quarter asked or given. This is racing Southern style. In the third pocket, Pete Hamilton regains his lead with Jimmy Van Diver in the draft. Diver as he drops down low under Hamilton and Herschel McGriff moves up to play. It's a threesome on the front chute and Jim Van Diver screams into the lead. McGriff follows him to take over second. Pete Hamilton falls back into the third spot. The leads change fast and often with these boys. Action on the back chute. Dean Dalton in car number seven blew his engine coming out of turn two and spun down onto the infield grass. Dalton is all right, but through for the day. With a caution flag out, cars take the opportunity to pit, and the action is fast and furious.
On the restart, David Pearson has the lead with Cuckoo Marlin running second. David was a late qualifier and started this race way back in the 28th position, but he's a front runner now. The pace car pulls off, and there's the green. In the first turn, Marlin jockeys his Chevy to the low side and challenges Pearson for the front spot. Down the long back stretch, Pearson jabs his 21 Mercury back into the lead and Van Diver moves up to second place. Diver tries David in the low groove and passes him to take the lead away. Now Pete Hamilton is on the move. He also passes Pearson to take over second, forcing David back into third. On to the tri-oval. Hamilton makes a bid for the lead and takes it. The car's refueled on the last caution flag. Some will try to make it all the way, and the pit crews are worried as to whether or not they can go the distance. Meanwhile, on the back chute, Pearson has regained his lead from Hamilton. She wrote for Pete Hamilton. He just blew the Hemi in that Plymouth, and he'll have to park it behind the wall. Cuckoo Marlin in the 14 Chevy takes up the chase and pushes Pearson through every turn of the racetrack. Marlin does it. He takes the lead away from David down the front chute, right in front of the grandstand. Look out! The engine let go in Jerry Cook's Chevy. He spun it, then got hit by Slick Gardner in the number one car. The caution flag is out, and Pearson limps into the pits out of gas. difficulty starting the car. They push him, they finally get him out and underway. But a half lap behind leader Cuckoo Marlin, who brings him down now for the green flag. Now there's another question. Does Marlin have enough gas to finish? He did not pit on the last yellow flag. the high bank fourth turn for the last time and Cuckoo Marlin takes the checkered flag. Herschel McGriff finishes second. A.J. Foyt is third. David Pearson's try for the fuel economy run cost him a top spot. He finishes ninth. Marlin and his crew pull into victory lane. Cuckoo's son is the chief mechanic on this hot little Chevy. They build it and maintain it themselves. Their trip into victory lane was a result of a lot of hard work, but a job well done.
they finally did it. They put the old cutlass in a new box. For the past two or three years, there were strong rumors reflecting a body change for GM intermediates. And here it is. Our tester came with enough goodies to run the window sticker all the way around the car, like this plexiglass sunroof. Swivel bucket seats made entry and exit very easy. Both the bumper and the grill give way in the event of impact. We might add that these seats were probably the most comfortable in the industry, giving excellent back as well as side support. Our cutlass had the 455 cube mill up front, but our acceleration runs were not neck snappers. 30 miles an hour took 3.5 seconds. Even with a four-barrel carb, our net horsepower had shrunken considerably over the 1971 models. This one, 225. Zero to 50 in 5.5 seconds. Before emission control systems were added, this car would make the zero to 70 run in the high sevens. Now it ate up 10.8 seconds on the clock. Brakes were good in the Cutlass. From 30 miles an hour, the stop came 40 feet later. With the discs hot, she wanted to pull to the right, and quite a bit of correction was necessary to keep it in a straight line. We used up 93 feet on this 50 mile an hour stop. This is the all out 70 mile an hour panic run, and Zowie, watch the nose dive. We didn't realize it was this great until we checked the film. It looked like it was gonna burrow beneath the track. 198 feet to the south. Our tester had the 442 suspension package, but it seemed as though they softened the spring race because there was a great deal more body roll through the pylon course than previous 442s. The outside front corner displayed considerable dive. However, the front end showed no tendency to wash out, and the rear followed through in good shape. We rated rebound and recovery about average. It was the reverse spin that showed the suspension system to be a lot softer than other 442s we've tested. With all the slack out on one side, body lean was very noticeable, inside as well as out. Our Cutlass took to high-speed cornering on the track better than it did to the tighter turns through the pylon. Even with the additional weight from the big engine, the front end hung in well through all the corners. Riding characteristics were excellent. The 442 option this year is primarily a sport appearance package, including a specific grill, hood louvers, side striping, hood and deck striping, and the special suspension package consists of front and rear stabilizer bars, higher spring rates, and shock absorbers. The new Cutlass engines employ a flex head intake valve, producing lower valve temperatures along with hardened exhaust valve seats. The use of valve rotators is being continued. The generator incorporates an integral regulator and an idle stop solenoid eliminates dieseling in all engines. An exhaust gas recirculation system has been added to V8 engines and Oldsmobile officials claim that drivability, fuel economy and performance have been maintained at past levels. Fuel consumption on our test car averaged out at about 10 miles per gallon. Whether this new body will be around as long as the last one, we don't know. But it is a good, clean styling job and should receive excellent consumer reaction. Due to certain restrictions placed on the automakers, performance is not as good as a 1971 442. However, by today's standards, it's a good car and should keep Oldsmobile sales charts on the rise. Thank you.